<laughs> okay. So guys, exchange. This is what we have covered so far. So in exchange, we have one client, two exchange server, one active directory, one forest, one exchange organization. So here this is a client, this is exchange two, and this one is exchange one. And this is also a DC as well. Uh, on Active Directory side, we have a forest. So this is our forest. And in this, we have one exchange organization. And that one exchange organization is Kenneth Exchange. And in this exchange, there are two exchange servers. ES1. And ex2, and both of them has one default gate, one default database. So as soon as you install the exchange for the first time, it automatically creates one database inside. Uh, now this exchange server is a mailbox server. It is CAS, and it is Hub. The other one is just a mailbox. Other one is just a mailbox. Uh, third one is a client. Oh, the third exchange. Yes, we're going to need that later. For now, it's just two exchange servers. So let's look at. Let's have a look at our exchange. We all know that Exchange Management Console, which is EMC, is the main console of Exchange, where you configure Exchange, manage Exchange. Uh, so first thing, EMC. Within EMC, guys, EMC is divided into three main portions. Uh, that is organization. Server and recipients. So let's look at this. In organization level, On organization level, you have everything that comes under the organization, exchange organization, that you can configure under exchange organization. So this is my organization. Under organization, I have mailbox, I have CAS, I have hub, and I have UM. Uh, whereas under server, I have all three. But guys, this organization, under organization, what you see in mailbox and CAS, that is configured for the complete organization. So whatever settings you do under organization on mailbox, uh, whatever settings you do on this, this will affect your complete exchange organization. So which means if you have 20 exchange servers throughout Canada in this exchange organization, this portion will affect your complete organization. Whereas, this, this will affect each and every server that you make changes on. So this is server-based settings, this is organization-based settings, and this is just recipient-based settings, user settings. Yes. Uh, each one is uh, one other role, right? It's 
Edge transport server, yes. You don't see that. Yes, it is not here for Edge. There is a different uh, console. So Edge is not, so we also uh, mentioned last time that Edge is one role that is not mixed up with anything. So Edge is on totally separate server that is non-Active Directory server. So that's why you don't see Edge here. Uh, can we use Edge as Hub? Yeah, hub as Edge? So we can use Hub as Edge. But what do you have to do additional on Hub? Manual configuration. Manual configuration. You need to do all the uh, anti-spam rules, anti-virus rules, any other rules on Hub, whereas on Edge, they are already uh, in place. So, thank you. So, so here organizational level. So today we're going to explore organizational level and server level. So today you have to have uh, this running. Uh, now in this, let's let's jump on to first organizational level. So on organizational level, there are two things. There is a federation trust. There is organization relationship. So federation trust. Federation trust is mostly between two different organization in two different places. So federation, most of the time, this won't work. This is, this is, this is for other organizations that are running. Uh, uh, you can remember it as a trust, just like a forest trust. It has a federation trust. So most of the time, this will be empty. You won't see anything in here. So your main configuration starts from the mailbox role. Within mailbox role, first of all, there is database management. And here it shows you the one database that is by default created. Now, the concept of database, guys, the concept of database we already know is this. That here you have, this is your, so here we have mailbox server, it is a CAD server, and it is hub server. But being a mailbox server, it has one database inside. There is one database in it. Now, that one database, this database is, to start with, it's given a random name. Just like when you start a new computer, it's given a random name. So later on, you would you would change it to a meaningful name or create a new database. For example, uh, that database is for Toronto people. So you can you can name it. You 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 follow standard naming convention and name it properly. But for now, this database. What is in the database? This database is specially for mailboxes. So all your mailboxes are sitting are sitting in this. So mailboxes, this is your mailbox database. And since it is a database, it is a database, as you can see, there is another word with this that is known as mounted. Mounted means that it is working. Mounted means that it is it is working. Now, now mounted, if it is dismounted, so if you right click on this database, it gives you an option of database, uh, dismount database. Dismount means as soon as dismount, so there is a word mount and dismount. Mounted means it's working. Dismounted means it's not working. It is available, but it's not working. Not working means no users can connect to mailboxes. So if a database is dismounted, which is this word, if it is dismounted, it's not functioning. Dismounted, not functioning. Mounted means functioning. Now, um, in order to test this out, in order to test this out, let's log into uh, log into OWA with one of the users that is part of this database. Now, since we have only one database, which means all our recipients are sitting in this database, there is no other database. So, in order to test this out, what I'll do is I'll log into M Ali. Log into MLE account, and as you can see, I am connected now. So all you need to do, open OWA. How do you open OWA? Let's do it one more time. Let's let's do it let's do it uh, one more time here. So guys, OWA. Uh, so guys here, uh, let's open OWA. So in order to open OWA, we need to go into CAS under server configuration. 
So you need to go into CAS under server configuration, and here you would jump on the Outlook web access. Guys, these small little words. Uh, so OWS. All versions it is known as access and here in 2010 it is called app so so app or access you need to remember both words so this is how the main function is it is it's a web client so if you do not have uh, outlook in your environment although main client for exchange is outlook so you must have outlook in order to in order to use all the features so on this one you must have Outlook. But this is a web client. This is a web client. Now within a web client, so once you are logged in, guys, everybody's logged in. You couldn't find it? No, oh, okay, okay, it's fine. Um, as long as you know how to log in. Now, I'm going to dismount this database. And once we dismount the database, we'll see then what happens to the mailbox. So you can think of this as uh, you can think of this as uh, a working exchange going down. So for now, I'm able to send and receive emails. I'm able to send and receive emails, which I can do a basic mail flow test. And the basic mail flow test is sending to my myself. So let's let's do a, this the, a quick test on this because we have started these labs after one week. Uh, you must do a mail flow test on this. So let's do a mail flow test, and and it's working. So Exchange is working at the moment. Now I'll jump back to EMC. Within EMC, all I need to do is right click on this database. Uh, actually under organization right click on this database and dismount now dismount <coughs> means that now you data this database that has all the mailboxes is down completely and at this point if you go back to outlook web access or outlook web app and refresh as soon as you try to refresh it gives you this error message so guys which means now which means that if if database is dismounted in exchange environment, it's a big, huge issue. So if there's another database available, will it automatically? Yes. If you have high availability, if you have database availability groups configured, then at this point, it would it would jump onto the next database. That's the DAG? That, that is called DAG. So how many databases you can uh, How many copies you can have? You can have 16 total copies of one database 16 or many so this is the we'll, we'll go through that at that yes how many that's because you have exchange installed in three that's why i have three as well <laughs> okay, yes, it was three exchange server. i have only one exchange server. that's right and we are under so, so guys, let's mount the database again. All you need to do, mount the database. And as soon as database is mounted, and you go back to OWA, refresh, it should be connected. Can you right click in properties to see the, like, what the size of the database is? Can you check? Is oh, yes, yes. I'm going to go through that. Order. I'm going to go through. In our case, it shouldn't show the message because we have three. No, no, no. no. So each database has its own mailbox. Even if you have three, so you need to find out which is the main database where this user account is. So, so maybe you connect you, to that database? Yes, the one, one, yes other exactly. It will not revert to the other? No, no, it won't. It won't. So guys, and a very important question. The question is, so so let's see, I have two databases. In my case, I have only one exchange, that's why I see. 
let's say you have two exchange server and both have databases. So under organization on this level, exchange, under organization, this is ORG, under ORG you have mailbox, and in mailbox you see two databases, the DB1 and DB2. Now if these both databases are totally separate databases, this, if this database is down, this database cannot do anything. This has its own mailboxes, the other one has its own mailboxes. So for now, they are not in high availability configuration. So they're just connected to a local uh, mailbox, they local are, database. Exactly. So if you dismount this database, if you dismount this database and your mailbox is sitting here, so it won't affect your mailbox. Okay, because... Because you dismounted this and your mailbox yeah. is sitting on the other one. Okay, so, so this is a very, very simple test of mount and dismount. Now let's go back to uh, EMC again. Let's go to the properties. Let's go to the properties of the same database. Now once you right click on this database, the property says number one is where this database is sitting. So here we just saw the database. Under mailbox, you have a DB. And DB, we just saw mounted, mount and dismount. And now we're checking the properties of a DB. In a properties of a DB, the very first, very important thing is where is actually this database sitting? Where is the database sitting? So now within the same database, we need to go to properties and need to see the location of DB. Need to see the location. So the location of DB is this. C program file, Microsoft Exchange Server, V14. Inside this location, you have this database. So this database is sitting here, and the name of the database is this. Name of the database, Enrich735, which is a random name. Now let's go to this location. Do we know what is EDB? Exchange database. It's the main exchange, exchange database. database file. So as you can see, this database is, actually that file is mounted here. So that is the file that is mounted. So now let's go to this location. So two ways to go to this location. Either you copy the complete path, so you copy this path or go to this path manually. How do you go to go to this path manually, which is right here? So C, program files, Microsoft, we saw this last time, where you have all different type of files sitting here. Now, now this is your this is this is your location of this database. Number one. Why do we need to know the location of the database? Now it's by default, all databases are sitting in C drive, which is not a best practice. You must place exchange databases on other drives than your uh, than your exchange server. So, sorry, other drives than your system drive. So let's see let's see this this machine here. Um, so this is my exchange server, and exchange server has has one disk which is C drive, and for now the database is sitting in the C drive, guys. Why this point is important? Because in whatever environment you go to, whichever environment you go to, Exchange is not sitting in C drive. You will never place Exchange database in C drive, because Exchange C drive, this is a system drive. So at the moment, database is sitting here. We need to move this database to another drive. So for that, this is the, this is the exercise we're going we're gonna to do. So here, we are going to add two drives here. We'll call them E drive and F drive. So we are going to add two drives to this exchange server. We are going to call it E drive and F drive. And then we are going to move the, the database file in this. So this database has EDB file. And the same, same place you have transaction log file. Transaction log. In all the exchange environments, guys, you would see that database files are sitting on a different drive and exchange and transaction log files are sitting on different drive, and there is a reason for this. But first of all, let's see. For now, all your files are sitting. How do you know? All here. If you go to this, this location, these all text files with these numbers, these are transaction log files, and right at the end, if you go to 
EDB file. So in the same place, so these are transaction log files. And right under this, and there are many, this is your database file right here. So at the end. So we keep database file on this drive. And we are going to keep transaction log files on this drive. Now this is, I'm giving you a best practice of exchange databases. In interviews, if they ask you, what do you know about exchange database? Number one, exchange database is uh, has all of the mailboxes, number one. Number two is we keep exchange database on different drive other than system drive. You don't you never keep uh, databases with the although the default location mm -hmm. of the exchange database is in the system drive. Mm -hmm. So we are going to either move it or we are going to create a new database for our environment and then keep half uh, database here and transaction on files. partition or drive. Hmm? On a separate partition on the same drive or a separate drive? Separate drive. Totally separate, separate, separate drive. Totally separate. Not, not, in, not even a second separate partition. Physical hard drive. Means. Physical hard drive, yes. In other words, in other words, this can be this can be a logical unit numbers from the SAN drive. But our system drive can be on a different partition. You said it shouldn't be on the system partition. Yes. But we can store it on a different partition or no? I mean, uh, it's, it's, so it's, best practices it is it snowing outside? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Number one. No way. No. What? Yes. So, what do you know about the database? Number one, databases. Uh, that databases contains mailboxes. Database contain a mailbox. Number two, never keep the database in a system drive. So we keep databases on two different drives. Now, what is the reason in two different drives? Now, if the reason is, so if, as we remember, the database, so this is your database, and database has uh, EDB file, EDB file, which is the main database, so I would say this is db1.edb, and then it has transaction log file, so it has, let's say, e000001.log uh, file. So, very simple to understand, guys. If this database is dead for any reason, if this database is dead, it is crashed, it's not working, you can rebuild that complete database with transaction log files. So, with the, if you have these transaction log files, what you can do, so basically, this, these are all your transaction log files. And everything that you had in your environment is written in, the, in these transaction log files. So if everything is written here and this database is completely dead, what you can do, you can rebuild the same database by just running this transaction log file again and that same database will be. So basically, this is your lifeline for the database. Uh, so this is why we, we want to keep database and drive and the database in a different drive. And then, so for example, if this drive goes down, you can rebuild from here. But if they are sitting on the same drive, then you can't rebuild because both of them down. So for that reason, uh, you can you can rebuild. So for that reason, transaction log files are kept in a different place, uh, whereas log whereas database file is kept in a different place because you can rerun the transaction log file. Log file be rebuilt. You can rebuild the complete database as long as they are available. As long as they are available. The log files goes down, right? So, it, it gets so yes. you can only rebuild it from log files? Uh, you can rebuild it from log file, but if log files are not available, then you can restore it from backup, right? You can go back to the backup, then rebuild it. Um, can you can we export the database to different format? I mean, a different move or export it. Um, export. So there are two things: either to backup, like SQL, or to another no, no, form no, of, it uh, cannot. No. It cannot. So, good question. Uh, can we have SQL or Oracle as a backend database for Exchange? No. It has it, it. It uses its own techniques. And this database system is is called ESE. It is called ESE. Same type of database that Active Directory is working. Active Directory is also ESE, Extensible Storage Engine. Active Directory. NTDS also is the, this type of database. So just like if based on your question, can we install Exchange in SQL? No. Can we install SQL uh, in Oracle? No, but it is ESE type of a database. 
Extensible storage engine. So this type of database is only used in Exchange or other programs also? Uh, most of Microsoft programs. Most, most of Microsoft, Microsoft programs. Yeah, yeah, most of Microsoft. Like Active Directory uses ESC. Okay. Active Directory, it is extensible storage, storage engine. engine. Yeah. So Active Directory uses ESC. Exchange uses ESC. Um, I think that there are there are two other products okay. of Microsoft that use it. But other than Microsoft, this is just a Microsoft uh, proprietary uh, technology. It's not for anybody else. Now, uh, let's go back into EC, e e e EMC. In EMC, I have one database. But guys, let's go into server configuration. Under server configuration on mailbox server, now you see separate servers with separate databases. So whatever server is selected here, you would see separate databases on them. So this is how you know that where is your mailbox sitting, which which database. So for example, your main, your all users are on your first server. So you can select the first server and it would show you, okay, this number, uh, this database number is sitting on your first server. This is how you know. Because if you have three databases, how do you know that where is my mailbox? It is on first one, second one, or third one. So when you go under server configuration under mailbox here, you will see you select the server and it will show you where the database is sitting. Guys, going back to going back to organization under mailbox, today we are going through mailbox server role. Guys, mailbox server role is a very, very important role in terms of having all your mailboxes in terms of all users are dependent on mailbox. They connect from, so, so, so this is a client. Client connects to CAS, just like we, uh, we went through last time. From CAS, CAS is just a connection point. And from CAS, they are connected to mailbox. And within mailbox, they have a database. And within the database, they have, they have their mailboxes. So right now, uh, you are connected from Outlook OWA. From OWA, you connect to CAS. From CAS, you're connected to Peer. And the user is basically connected to his own mailbox right here. And this database is at the moment sitting in C drive, program files, exchange. Within exchange, it's sitting in V14. Then under that, it's mailboxes and in the database. And this database has uh, many files. We need to remember that. So it is the main file is EDB. Then it has log files. It has uh, reserved log files, JRS files. It has a checkpoint file. It has a, a temp.db file, temp.edb, and temp.log file. Yes. Last time we discovered CAS stuff, which is uh, Active Directory for Enterprise. Yes. So which service or what is CAS itself? No, in Active Directory. In Active Directory, actually, CAS is dependent on Active Directory, not Active Directory dependent on CAS. Okay. So which means CAS. So this is your AD. Guys, the question is, how does CAS goes to AD? How does it find out where AD is? Is that your when, question? When it reaches to Active Directory. Yes. Right. Which protocol is required for us? Exactly. So that protocol that is used is known as NDAP. And that. And that protocol. Guys, the word NDAP. NDAP stands for? NDAP stands for Lightweight Directory. Authentication protocol. So this is light weight directory. Is it directory access protocol or uh, I think it is access. Access, yes. right? Can you verify please? Guys, yeah. no, this and that. Now so far, what we know is Kerberos is responsible for authentication, right? Mm -hmm. Whenever a user authenticates from Active Directory, it's Kerberos that is used. So what is Kerberos? Kerberos is the one that takes your user account, takes it to Active Directory, verifies the user account, and creates a ticket and gives it to the user. So user when logged in directly to Active Directory. Now, guys, whenever, whenever 
any application needs and does the authentication function for any other user, it uses LDAP. So for users, when users directly go to, when you first time log into this machine, you first have to go to Active Directory, right? Yeah. Be uh, before OWA, before OWA. And that is using Kerberos. At that time, it is Kerberos. But whenever any application sitting in the middle helping you with authentication, that application uses LDAP. Because actually, basically, this application is doing authentication on your behalf. So LDAP is that lightweight directory access protocol. So you would see this protocol in many places, guys, in many places. So whichever file, whichever application uh, needs, so here basically you're in out, Outlook Web Access and you send your username and password, it is sent to CAS, CAS is sending it to, so how it is sending and receiving back the answer, it is through LDAP. So LDAP is that protocol. So uh, to answer you. VMware is also working on this. VMware. No. VMware. Yes, VMware. When it connects to Active Directory, it's also uses LDAP. So, okay. I have a question actually. This yes. database now, I'm showing, mine is showing two. Yes. Because I have two exchange servers. Yes. Right? So I have two databases. Now, how do I know which one it's connected? It says mounted. So both are mounted. Both are mounted. And if you go here, under this, so the, on your server one, it is this database. If you just go here, it ends with 3118. Okay. And the second database is on this that ends with 8008. So now, no, no, this is the same database. Same database? This is the servers. These are the two servers you have, yeah. right? So on this server, the database is 311. So if, if you need to see which one is your first server, it is it is this one. This is your. And the other way is you can go to properties and also see it here that it is sitting on this server. Okay. Okay. Hmm? On the right hand side, it shows the server. Here. Yeah. That's how you know. Here. Yeah. yeah. This one? Yeah. Master? It shows the server. Name. Oh, this one. Yeah, server name. See, that's how you know. They're different. So, so this is server. showing, okay, yeah. this is sitting on this one? Yeah. This is sitting on this one. Oh, yes. And then when you go to zero 01, it yeah. shows zero 01, and then you go to zero 02, it, it will show zero 02 down there. Okay, but then um, when he clicked on this, so it shows that the first one is hub transport, the roles, right? These three roles, and the second one is only this role. It means that these are the roles installed on the Yes. Oh, okay. But it's connecting to both actually. It's supposed to show both. Yeah, it's supposed to show both. Yes. मुझे लग रहा है कि यहाँ बैठने से ज़्यादा समझ आ रही है नान सामने से देख रहा हूँ तो ज़्यादा समझ आ रही है मैं फ्रंट से बोर्ड पे देखो करीब से देख रहा हूँ समझ आ रही है मुझे नहीं यहाँ तो ये है या फिर ये कि क्योंकि वो आरएफ के साथ नहीं नहीं मेरा मतलब ये था कि ये डिस्ट्रैक्ट बहुत करता है ना डिस्ट्रैक्ट होता है आपको कैसा लग रहा है इधर बैठ के अब तो ठीक है ये बड़ी हरकत की बात आपको जो नॉलेज है शायद वो भी जाने लगे आसपास I'm just joking. Yeah. 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 Okay. Certification. <laughs> okay, guys, here. So, this is first of all, let's look at this. Again, let's go into uh, database properties. So, within database properties, the very first thing is the location. So, if you ever need to know where is this database located on your disk, it is in this place. So later on, we're going to move this database to E drive and F drive. For now, let's just go through this. First of all, it's showing you that where is it located, number one. 
Number two, it is showing, is it mounted or dismounted? Number three, which is the hosting server? Because this is very important to know, if you have 20 exchange servers in your environment and you need to see where is your database, it is sitting right here on this server. Now, when was it modified last time? It is, it is at this point and server hosting copies, if there are other copies of the same database. So later on, we are going to uh, go through that. DAG is basically right. DAG, just remember, it is clustering in Exchange 2010. DAG is used for clustering. It's a new clustering technology. It is clustering in Exchange 2010. And, and it needs to be configured. So later on, we are going to configure this. But if DAG is configured in, in this environment, then you would see that this it, the same database has other copies on other servers as well. So here it would show it. It stands for Database Availability Group. Thank you. Uh, so uh, Database Availability Group. And which is basically, it's another tab right here on the same. So this tab is known as Database Availability Group or DAG. So on this side, if you are under organization, if you're under mailbox, uh, and this is, it's empty for now because we haven't created DAG at the moment. Now, going back to database management, under database management, you go to properties. So it gives you that basic information about just this database. Secondly, guys, you go into maintenance. On maintenance, it has a it has few very important things about Exchange that are very important. They might ask you at interviews. So first of all, in Exchange, there is something called general recipient. General recipient. Now, this general recipient is a person who would get copy of each and every message that is sent to this database. So if you ever want to configure an account that should receive each and every copy of uh, each and every copy of the email, you want you as an organization. So so here, let's say um, exchange server, a database, mailboxes. Let's say this has 300 mailboxes. So 300 mailboxes. Now on 300 mailboxes, obviously 300 users are connected, and each mailbox can send multiple emails or it can receive multiple emails. Let's take an example of only one mailbox. This user. This email, it is sent to this second user. So one email sent to the other. Guys, in Exchange, now, now this is a database, and this is a property of a database. If you, if you closely look, this is a database, and under database, you have this account. And this account is general recipient. Now, this account will be an account that will get a copy of all the emails from all mailboxes to this account. So basically, this will be a mailbox. This will be a mailbox. And this mailbox, so an email is sent here, but a copy of this is also sent to this mailbox. So if you have, let's say, on this 10,000 users, and 10,000 users are sending 1 million emails, so all the copies will go to this account. So to start with, this is empty. We're not using it. But in some environments where they have security uh, is, is top priority, they would want to keep all the emails in a separate account. Um, it can be, and, and since it is a, it is a database level, uh, you're on a database level property, so all the emails that are going to this database are copied. Now, why would they do this? Incoming, outgoing, any email that hits this database that a copy of that email will be sent to this account. Now, why would they need to do this? Because guys, based on any government privacy laws, you cannot log into any other user's mailbox, or even if you are administrator. Even if you are exchange admin, although you can log into any mailboxes, but based on privacy laws, you should not. So what companies do, they can create an account, let's say they can create just a general account saying uh, exchange admin, JR at the rate Kenneth. So it, it, it will be a, just a simple account. So this is an account, but a copy of each email. Once it is configured here, in that it will receive copies of all the emails that are sent to this database. Now the same setting exists on a server level as well. For now, we are on a database level. 
Guys, in each exchange, you can have many other databases as well. It's not necessary you have only one database. Later on, we're going to create another database. So let's say same exchange server, you have a second database. Now this second database is specially created for executives. It is specially created for executives. Is there any reason why we are creating database for executives? Yes. Reason is to keep it separate, to one priorities as well, and to keep it separate. If anything happens to this, they should not be affected. But if executives are also in this, if your main database goes down, they, they would database their databases will go down as well. Now this one also has JR settings. If JR setting is not configured, you are not getting copies of that either. So basically, this is just to show you that this setting is just for the, this database. And later on, I'm going to show you there is the same GR setting on Exchange Server as well. You can do this as well. And if you do this, general recipient setting based on Exchange Server, what does that mean? Copies of all emails from all databases, from all users will go to this one, uh, to, to this one mailbox. So this is one thing. For now, it is not configured. Um, next one is maintenance schedule. No, but if it's a privacy law, then how come we have this? Uh, so, so this is why it why is, is not allowed? configured, but only in high security places. So you have a special database that is uh, that is for a complete department. Not it. It is not uh, tied to some specific user. So in that case, you just want to keep all the emails that are sending to all those groups to this one so email this box. One email Maybe and then only for the administrator has access to this. Right? Only administrator so has access, the, but you can add more people to it. The sender who's sending the email, he wouldn't know that they, it's, it's going. They won't they know. know. They won't know. It's, it's internal exchange. Because otherwise, if you send a copy, you you put CC or BCC. Exactly. In that case, that they case won't know. know. They won't know. Um, so, which means if you're using Gmail, if you're using Yahoo Mail, if you're using anything, they also have this feature. So we would never know that they are accessing our mailboxes mm -hmm. and everything, because these settings exist in all emailing system. Uh, and and here, it, it's just very simple. It's just very simple. All you need to do, create one account, and let's say just enable it. In order to enable this account, all you need to do go into this and select any of the existing accounts that we had created last time. Or you can create a special account in Active Directory with special mailbox, just add it. So for example, in this case, I'm going to use uh, Emily's account. So Emily account. Now Emily is a... Hmm? OK, so let's get a more... Arif Khan is fine. <laughs> okay, next one is guys maintenance schedule. Guys, maintenance schedule. Now this is very, very important in exchange. And in maintenance schedule, this is what happens. So first of all, maintenance schedule at every um, daily at 1 a.m. to 5 uh, to 5 a.m. Guys, during this time, during this time, what it does, it automatically does the defrag of exchange database. It does online defragmentation of exchange database in the background while exchange is running. So this is maintenance. Maintenance between 1 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, 5 a.m. Uh, these are off-peak hours for some organization. Other organization, it might not be off-peak hours. The, the companies that are working. So this is why you can change the schedule by clicking customize. If you click customize, you can change this timing. Now. Why would you need to change this timing? Guys, in this case, what it does, it does automatic, automatic defrag of database. Now, automatic defrag of database. This defragmentation of database is very important. Guys, in previous version, version 2007, 2003, 2000, in previous version, defrag of database, you have to take down the database. So the only way you can defrag a database, you have to you have to dismount the database, and then you can. Leave. But what is the meaning of dismount? No one can access the, their emails. So in Exchange 2010, it does online defragmentation. Your exchange is up; people are using it, but in the background, it runs these process. 
Not only this, but it would also delete, uh, uh, it, it would also delete the accounts that had reached their tombstone lifetime. Tombstone lifetime, as just like in Active Directory, in Active Directory, once you delete a user account, it stays in Active Directory for how many days? 180. No. Um, I think uh, it is 30 days. 46. 180. 180. Okay, anyways, guys, 30 days, 180 days, 190 days, or 200 days. Why it's fine. Guys, during that time, you don't have to restore that account. That is tombstone. Once it is, it passes that amount of time, it is deleted, it's gone. Guys, in this case, what it does, so it would it would delete permanently delete delete all mailboxes. It deletes all mailboxes that have reached the tombstone lifetime. Delete all mailboxes or messages. No, this is one part, this is second part. So defragmentation. So I'm going to go back to defragmentation. But it deletes all mailboxes that stolen. Now what is defragmentation, guys? Defragmentation is a simple defragmentation. Just like in disks, you have you have to do defragmentation. So in databases, same thing. So what is a defrag? Defrag is this. You have a database, and with time, what happens is there are portions of the database that are that are empty. So this is this is used empty. So these portions that are empty, this would slow down the access of. So this is empty. This is empty. This is empty. And when the head has to read these emails, it has to go through. So one email may be sitting here, and then a part of email is sitting here and here and here, three different places. So what defrag does, defrag guys, it would it would first of all clean up, take all the empty spaces at the end, and will try to make and will try to keep them in sequence. So one message would be in one line. So it would so defragmentation is that complete maintenance of database. Now the important thing to know is if previously the important thing to know is previously defragmentation for defragmentation guys you have to take dismount the database which means no exchange services but in this it is automatically done and at what time 1 a.m to 5 a.m it is not done in the daytime now in your organization if they have different timing priorities they can change it anytime in 2010 also right in what? 2010 in 2010 dismount. no no you don't have to you don't have to dismount but you can do offline defragmentation as well. If required, you can do that defragmentation. What about in 2007? In 2007, you have to yeah, take to, down the database know. and then do the defragmentation. Here, it is doing online maintenance, yes. Does it cause disruption to the service? Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't. It, no, it doesn't. But, uh, but it would use some server resources. Once it starts, it would start using background resources. And if your server is busy during, especially your servers are busy during 9 to 5. So right at 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., your, your, your users are sending emails, receiving emails. At that time, if you start maintenance, guys, it would definitely affect your server performance. Yeah, there now, there is, there is a place we can change it. It is, it is right here. So I'm going to go to that. Uh, guys, the next one here is, next one, enable background database maintenance. So other than this maintenance, other than this maintenance, it can do light maintenance, cleanup of, uh, cleanup of active directory. So that light maintenance is enabled 24-7 on ESC scan. So this light maintenance is already enabled for us. Other than this timing, you can also, it can, it is also doing a lot of other smaller maintenance. And if you disable it, it won't do that maintenance. If you enable it, then it is keep on doing that. Now, guys, again, this is especially for this one database. So this one database. Now, here it is, you have another option. Don't mount this database at the startup. 
So once once you once you start your if you created a new database, should it be mounted at the startup? Then you can just select it, and if you want, you you, you don't mount that database. And then this database can be overwritten by restore. If you ever are restoring databases, you can check this box. It can restore existing database and then goes on. Um, so so these are these are just normal options. But the most important option is this one: enable circular logging. So enable enable circular logging. This is a very important function in Exchange. Now enable circular logging. In enable circular logging, this is what it is. If this option is enabled, if this option is enabled, then what it does, it will keep on re, it will keep on overwriting uh, the Exchange transaction log file. If this option is enabled, if it is enabled, transaction log files are overwritten automatically to save disk space. What is the drawback? So the the advantage is you're gonna you're gonna save disk space. So I'm gonna explain that in a moment. Let's look at the disadvantage. You can't recover. Yes. There's the disadvantage there. is there are no log files, you cannot recover it from log files. Now your only option is the backup. If you have a good backup, you can restore it. Otherwise, you don't have any previous transaction log files. Because transaction log file, as soon as it reaches one, two, three, four, after four, again one, two, three, four. So it will keep on overwriting transaction log file. And th this advantage is do not have, we do not have any previous. So you do not have any previous transaction log file to rebuild the database. Your only option is restore from backup. Now nice circular logging Circular logging is an option uh, that we use only in emergencies. Circular logging is not used anywhere, only in emergency, where you do not have disk space and your exchange is dying because you do not have disk space and and and, and there is no time to extend the disk space so that exchange keeps on working. At that point, you can just enable circular logging. So what it does, if you look at this file. If, if we look at this folder, guys, this folder shows me all these transactions. So these are basically all transaction log files. As you can see, this one, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 45, and so on. Right from here, these are all transaction log files. What is the big advantage of transaction log file? It, you can rebuild. Don't use the word restore. Rebuild the, the database. Guys, restoring is... Restoring is different. Restore is from tape backups. So here, so rebuild. But circular log files meaning that it will every fourth, every fifth log file will start from one. So you don't see these many log files. Now, as you can see, you might think that this is just one MB inside. But guys, in large environment, these files are created in thousands and millions. So so circular logging is one option. So in interviews, they might ask you, is there any way you can save this space uh, uh, for uh, from uh, transaction log files? So answer is circular logging. But then you must explain 
that circular logging is not an option that should be used all the time. It is only used in emergency. Because the biggest disadvantage is that you would you won't have any previous log file to rebuild your database. Yes. Uh, no, we we use it in large companies as well, just in emergency situation. Okay, going back on X EMC, guys in EMC. So right here, next next tab is again important for a database. Now now this tab, oh. guys this tab. How do you bring up that menu? Which one? This one? No, the other one. This one. This one. This, this is one? a mailbox, right? So I'm on organization. On. Under organization, I'm on mailbox, and you go on to database, and then here under this. Guys, the next one is also very important. The next one is, the next one is. What are the limits on, of mailboxes on this exchange server? For example, at any point in time, if any mailbox reaches uh, 1 MB, uh, sorry, 1 GB, this is 1.9, uh, 1 1.9 GB, 1.9 GB. Yeah. At any point in time, it reaches 1.9 GB, the user will get a warning that your, your mailbox is about to, uh, to reach the limit, so it is MP, but it's 1,000. So 1.9 GB. Guys, at two uh, at two GBs, at two GBs, it will stop you from sending any emails, and at 2.3 GBs, it will uh, it will it, you won't be able to receive anything. Now, guys, these limits these limits are for all mailboxes for all mailboxes within this database. So again, remember that we're doing all these changes. We're doing all these changes on a database. So it will affect all the mailboxes. So guys, this is another reason why would you need to have a separate a database for executive. Because for executive, you might want to give them different limits. You might want to give them more limits for their mailboxes. Not so. So this is the, these are the limits, so, and this will apply to guys. This will apply. So here we'll say limits. Limit says 1.9 is warning, and and two 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 get is you cannot send, so cannot send, and 2.3 get cannot send and receive, cannot send and receive. Now here you can change it, you can change it. So you can change this. Once it is changed, it will change for all your mailboxes. Can you think of any reason why you should not change it? Why you should not change it? And how would it affect your exchange environment if you change it? Huh? It will start taking immediately. It will start taking more space. It will it will give more access, more disk space to each mailbox. And once it starts giving more access, uh, it won't affect the network, but it will definitely affect the disk. Now, guys, where, where is this database sitting? It is sitting basically, for now, it is sitting in C drive. So as soon as you give more limits to each, this is giving limits to each thick, user. Thick provision, right? It's, if you give the limit. Take then basically you're reserving, reserving that. Space. This is yeah. like in in VMware reservation mm -hmm. and and reservation. those. So okay. Uh, now the second thing is uh, warning message interval is daily at 1 a.m. So any of the mailboxes that have reached their limit or any warning, it will start sending the messages at this point at this time. Guys, the next section is deletion settings. So keep deleted items for 14 days. Keep deleted items for 14 days. Keep deleted mailboxes for 30 days. So here, the tombstone life time for each mailbox is 30 days. And for each message in your mailbox, so in your out, uh, in your OWL way for applying, it's 14 days. For till 14 days, message will be kept in your deleted items. After 14 days, it will be cleaned, so deleted. Nice. So basically, when this runs, when this runs, automatic maintenance runs, Whichever deleted items are more than 14 days, they'll be completely permanently deleted. Yes. Um, can you uh, 
control these settings through client at the client send yes, also? Yes, we can do that. From Outlook, because we there are certain options in Outlook to yes. the we can on the server that. for seven days and then. Yeah. Yes, so guys, it's a very important question. The question is, yes, this for now we're doing the database level changes. Can we do them on each user level? Yes, we can do that. So you can go to any user. For this user, you can do all these settings individually. Give him more access to the disk space. Uh, give him more dele deletion time. Or, or, But you cannot change the mailbox deletion time. If mailbox is deleted, that is database level or server level. Yes. Why does this stuff can the user actually change? Nothing. None of this. Because this is Exchange Admin's task. This has to be done from EMC. Exchange Console, they won't have access to this. Even even users cannot change their own limits. But the deleting part. Even the delete, deleting part, they cannot change. On the client, yeah, there are some settings that you can do. Because they had relaxed set settings on them. I mean, you go here and change it to, let's say, 900. But the user settings cannot override these settings. If you do some setting. No, like user settings will override this. Will override this. Will override this. Is it out of we have an option to keep the mailbox and server for certain days? Yes, no? yes. It's so all up to you. It's all up to you yeah. how much privileges you want to give to your users. So, yes, in your case, uh, these are default database settings. You can have server based settings as well, but you can also give users access so that they can make changes. Yes. Since we can make a uh, this is for every user. So how, won't the database stop that user no, it won't. It won't. So, guys, the question here is: if you have database level changes, <coughs> and if I give more privileges to Nasir, which one will override what? So, Nasir setting will override server setting or the database setting. So if I give him more privilege, he can access it. So this will override these settings. Okay, so next one is client settings here. Guys, client setting is empty. It is for public folder. It's for offline address book. We're going to check that out later. Uh, but for now, most important database settings are maintenance, which is you have general settings here. Then you have limits. In limits, this is very important to know that on, on database level, you can do all these changes. Next one on the same organization and mailbox level is database availability group. Yes. I don't have these many tabs. Let me take my mailbox. We have these tabs. Are you here. under an organization? Organization configuration. Are you under mailbox? mailbox? Yes. You don't have these tabs? I have one, two, three, seven tabs. So I have seven tabs. One, two, one, two, oh, you're, oh, okay. They're just. Yes. A minor okay. in one so here, guys, you have database availability group. Guys, database availability group. What do we know about DAG? What is DAG? DAG, DAG. It is clustering in Exchange in Exchange 2010. It is a new option in clustering. So later on, we're going to do clustering. For clustering, we need to have three Exchange servers with three databases so that we can create copies. Uh, you have sharing uh, sharing policies here. Now, sharing policies, sharing policy, especially for calendaring. Guys, even if you are in real environment and you are here on sharing policies, you would see that it is calendar sharing, free busy information. Now here, this is it has it is a policy that applies to all users in this database. And what type of policy? So it is calendar sharing policy. Now calendar sharing policy. Three users, three users, and this user wants to have a meeting and need to invite these two people. So they are managers from different departments. Guys, this policy dictates, this policy dictates that if this user is able to see their free busy information, their availability, for example, he wants to have it on uh, Monday, Monday between 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. So this policy says that this user can this user see their information or are they sharing their availability with this user so that he can book their time? So this, this policy is this. By default, all users can see all users' availability. Although you can make it more restrict by just going into this policy and you can you can just make changes to this. That for now it's saying that all users can have access to all of the other users. But here, specify mailboxes that the sharing policies apply to. You can also apply sharing policies to later mailboxes. For now, you can create separate policies for separate users. 
uh, uh, most of the time this policy applies, this policy we configure it right from the user level, not from complete database level. On a database level, you keep, you have to keep it as is, because you don't customize on database level. But for now, we just need to understand that this is sharing policy, sharing policy for calendar, calendar sharing. And, and guys, there is one more important thing in exchange, this word is this word is frequently used, free busy information. In exchange, especially, this is this refers to your calendar settings or calendar availability. So if somebody says, uh, have you checked their free busy information in exchange? Now, free busy information is not a common word used in IT, is not a very common word used in between uh, employees as well, but this is for exchange admin. So free busy information means uh, that all your calendar availability, what times are you available in, uh, what time ca uh, are you having other different meetings. So, so this is why it is known as calendar sharing free, free, busy, uh, free busy and it's a simple policy. Now, other than this, you have again a database. Guys, we are looking at the database. We are looking at one database. On this one database, on this one database, uh, actually, we're looking at mailbox for all the, these are the address lists. Guys, these address lists, lists, so let's go on to our OWA. Within our OWA, once you go into, uh, so in OWA, you can go to new. And within new, you click two, and this is your address book at the moment. So as you can see, so this is, it says address book. Now this address book, let me go there again one more time. If you're not following me, write it down somewhere how to access address book for a user. So all you need to do, just, just have quick pointers, uh, go to Outlook, then open a new email, go to Outlook, open a new email, and just click to, or you can, you can click here as well, address book. So address book is here, or you click to, address book will open. Guys, this address book is basically coming from that setting, uh, EMC. So the same address, now what is in the address book? It's the addresses of all your complete organization. So it, it can show you, uh, it can show you availability, uh, 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 all rooms availability. And on this side, this their free busy information as well. So as soon as you select any person, you would see their free busy information on this. So this is referred to as free busy information. Now, going back to EMC here, so these address books, if you need to provide some more, so these are default address books here. You have all contacts, all users, all rooms, all, uh, 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 all groups, and then default address book. So here you see this address book, guys, sometimes we need to create special address books for just for marketing department, just for finance department, just for HR department, we can create all those address books here. For example, you right click on this and say new address book. And once you say, once you select new address book here, I can say this is for marketing department, address book, and next. So this is marketing. And, and then there, here you can select, okay, so what type of recipients do you want? Do you want to add all types of recipients? And then select the recipient container, or you want to you want to select some specific uh, recipient for this. Now here, yes. So right here, you, I just right clicked in this area. So I just right click in address book. You just need to go to organization, mailbox, and address book. Right click, create a new address book, and then name it marketing, finance, HR, or anything and then create a new address book. In this now, I need to create this address book only for marketing people. Now, how do you distinguish between marketing and other? All you need to do, you need to go into Active Directory and within Active Directory, you can create a OU called marketing, place all marketing users in OU and here in browse, you can just point to that OU. So let's go to Active Directory since we are here, let's go to uh, uh, ADUC, within ADUC, create a new organizational unit called marketing. Marketing and let's move 
one of the users in marketing that we created earlier. So where is this, this user? Ali. So I'm moving M Ali, or you can you can just move one of the users inside this OU. As soon as so I just created a OU and have one user inside. And all I need to do, I need to point this browse and here I'll just point it to OU marketing. Now this address list is now created for marketing. If you don't even select all other things, it's fine because this is now this is now you you're making a rule that uh, you want to use any other. For example, these are the same rules that you can create in Gmail or uh, Yahoo Mail or Hotmail for for selecting specific e uh, 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 emails for that. Create the user. So so here let me let me just finish this. So here we'll just go with default values and just create it. Okay, so question. So all I did was this. I went into ADUC, go there, create a new OU, and place one user in this OU. So the first thing is this. What's the name of the OU? Uh, marketing. marketing. No, just create a OU called marketing and move one of the users inside marketing. So this is on ADUC side. And then on the address side, all you need to do, go into EMC, go into EMC and under address list, just create that, that list and point it to that OU. Yes. Nothing. So just next, 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 Sitting in that OU, they will all have uh, this address. List. What do you do? We so that's how you create an that, No, that's how we create address list. So, I mean, uh, that's it. So, uh, you so user in marketing? Yes. And then, and then yeah, that, that's it. And then go here, go in this. Yes, just a second, just a second. So, address go here, okay. and then go to the address list. Name it marketing. So guys, other, other, sorry, uh, others create HR and finance. So create HR group, finance group, point it to them. Yes, address. 
And then you just want it for you. Guys, 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 yes. Okay. Guys, yes, just browse and point it to that HR OU. So three separate OUs? In okay. Huh? Three separate OUs. Three separate yeah. OUs. And then point the list to those. Point the address list to those. So, guys, let's see the difference here. Everyone. So we have two things here. Distributed group and address list. We need to have, we need to understand the difference. Distribution group and address, address list. <coughs> Guys, address list is just to make your life easier if you need to find people from your, your department. Address list is not something where you send one email to all group of people. This is where distribution, distribu distribution group is for. Distribution group. Distribution group is to send email to number of person at the same time. Address list is just to see. So let's go to o OWA and see how address list. In address list, if I go to new, and now here I select address list. Now if, for now I can see one, two, three, four, five, five users here. If you have 5,000 users, it would be very, very difficult to find those users, although you can search and find. But once you have your own address list, so that marketing, that would exist in this side, you can just select your own address list and then pick which people you need to send it. So address list is just to make a separate list for your own department. That's what address list is. Otherwise, if you need to create a distribution, so distribution group is different. So that is distribution group where we send one email to all your uh, all your department. Are we going to create the, the, the yes, we, we are going to create that. But that is under recipients, not here. So you have a separate uh, you have a separate place where you can get, here you have distribution group under recipients. So distribution groups are different. Now guys, here you have a retention policy. And retention policy is, so these are all of the retention policies for your mailboxes in this database. As you can see, here we have one month deletion. Here you have one week deletion. Here you have one year deletion. So whatever retention policy you want to apply to any of the mailboxes or, or whatever group, so these are all of the retention retention policies. Now, you can create your own retention policy as well. For example, let's look at this first one. One month deletion. And it is applied, as you can see, first of all, what type of policy is this? This policy is one month deletion. Second policy is one week deletion. Now, where is it applied to? It is only applied to personal folder. It is not applied to your complete mailbox. So if you have a personal folder, inside your inbox, inside your mailbox, then this will apply to only that, that fol folder. Now, why would, they, why would they make a policy especially for personal folder? Because guys, uh, this is your mailbox. So this is your mailbox. In this mailbox, you have inbox, you have outbox, you have all other, and under this, you most of the time, you will, users will create personal folders. Now in personal folder, in personal folder, they keep their personal emails or a or, or lot of things that are, uh, uh, they keep uh, software, ISOs, and this. But basically, guys, these policies are for personal folder. Why? To clean up the personal folder because wh why would they need to clean up personal folder? It's people's personal stuff. What is, this, what is wrong with this? I mean, why would you have this policy apply only to personal folder? How is it affecting your exchange server? It is taking space in your exchange server. If this would have been on their own disks, then we don't care. But even even on their own disk, your other your Active Directory IT department won't allow that. So that is active. But on exchange, you must create the, these policies that apply to personal folders and would keep on now. Now you can yeah, have. If you delete the PSP uh, folder. No, no, no. This is this is just saying that uh, after one month, so any, so delete and allow recovery is 30 days. Yes, if you delete. If you delete it, uh, so it's like from, from, or... Exactly. Or so, 
No, it doesn't. It would it would run in the background, and that is part of that regular maintenance that is happening. Uh, user won't know. User won't know. So so first of all, user de no no. It's not time. Yeah, this is not deleting your your files that are not deleted. So. It is, this policy is only running on your deleted files. You already deleted it. You don't care the, where, where does it go. So first this. Now, now this is, this will run, this will run when your regular maintenance runs. And where is our regular maintenance? Where is our setting for the regular maintenance? Guys, going back on database management and going on to properties. And this is, if you go here, this is, Enable background database maintenance. So part of the enable background database maintenance, it would run all the retention policies as well. So whatever retention policies are set up in your environment. Now, now in here, so we have address list, we have retention policies, and we have one more, which is offline address book. Offline address book. So guys, what is address book? Address book is uh, when people need to send email, they can see their list, they can see the people there. So marketing is one address book. Guys, the address book is available only if you're connected to Exchange. If you're not connected to Exchange, you cannot see this address book. But if you need for some address books to be available on user's machine, even when they are offline, then you can go into this and start creating offline address book. This is why you don't see all the address books that were here in address book. So, not, so here you can see more address book when you are connected. And when you are offline, there is only this one address book, which is uh, which is available. So this address book, is, and you can create more address book as well. Now, that means, in this case, the address book that you created for marketing department, for HR department, for finance, it won't be available if you're not connected. Now, second thing with offline address book is, this offline address book is available only with the Outlook version. It is not available with OWA. OWA, which is a web version, you will only be connected to OWA if your exchange server is up, if you have a connection. Outlook, on the other hand, Outlook can let you connect anytime. So Outlook is connected, Outlook is on, and if you have any offline address book that you want to provide to your, uh, uh, your users, your users, you can have them. Now, in general, in general, all companies would try to keep this to a very minimum. Because they don't want to share their contacts if you're not connected to your to, to your environment. So they would only create offline address book for uh, for maybe uh, some unimportant non-critical contacts, not for your own organization. Uh, guys, let's look at this mailbox. Let's look at mailbox under server configuration. Or before that, before that. So here, database management. Under database management, guys, now we're going to create a new database. We are going to create a new database for executives. So we are going to create this database now. Now, in order to prepare for this, this database and follow best practice, what is the, disk, uh, what is the best practice for, for uh, based on this space, for this, for a database? It should be on a different drive and not only one, two drives. One for the database and one for the log. So now I'm going to follow these steps. So the steps that we're going to do, we're going to add two disks. So add two disks to your main exchange server, exchange one. We're going to add two disks. We're going to for format the two disks, as you know. Once you add a disk, it is always in a raw. It is always a raw. You must format that disk. So you will format the disk to be maybe E drive or F drive or whatever drive that are available. If D is available, it can be D. If E is available, D is mostly your CD. So you have E and D, format it with E and D. And then once they are created, all we need to do is uh, on E drive, on E drive, create a folder. 
we create a folder called mailbox. And on F drive, create a folder called logs. So this is what we need to do before creating a database. So that once the database is created, it would ask me, where do you want to keep your mailbox database? Where do you want? So we'll just point to these. So we'll just point. So once the database is created, we'll point to, point to them. Now after that, we are going to create a database. Then in EMC, create a DB. Create a DB called executives and point the database to E drive and point the log files to F drive. Point the database to E drive, point the log files to F drive. So add to this guys, start adding add to this and format them with E and F, please. Add to this, add to this. Uh, default size uh, 20. I think for this, this is 10 provisioning, you won't huh? on exchange one. Twenty, yeah, default size. Hmm? Forty is fine. <laughs> what was that? Who was it? That sounds like somebody's watching the film. Which one? Uh, create adding a disk. Just go with default. Just next, next, next. Create a new disk. So there are two of the new mailbox database and new public folder. Now. Have you created the disk? No, yeah. No. Disks are done. Done. Okay, so I'm going to show you what it is. So it's a mailbox database. Mailbox. Database. It's blue. Hmm? It's blue oh, okay. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, uh, so, uh, so Mailbox. Yeah, what's the difference? Uh, public folder database is just for shared folders. It's not mailbox. It's not mailbox. Okay, so new disks. So I'm creating two new disks. You never formatted it, please. So format the two disks. Disk number one added. Disk number two added. And then we are going to go to computer management in 2008. In 2008, in order to format the disk, you can go, to, you can right click on computer and then manage. And then within manage, you can go to configurations. Within configuration, you can go to, oh no, storage. At the storage. Do we create volumes on those also? We do create yes. yes. We do create volume, right? Yes. Simple volume. So guys, I'm here in computer management and I'm going to format those two disks. So I can see these two disks that are raw disks. They are not formatted. So once they are added, I need to go into disk management under storage in computer configuration. Right click 
you need to first make it online and then initialize the disk and then format it. So format, next, 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 done. And so most, most of the settings are default settings. First online, initialize, format, and volume. Next, 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 done. Initialize this one and two. Yes, initialize yeah, online. Initialize. Actually, online initialize and format. And format. And format. Yes. It's, it's not. Uh, Why are you doing it at here? You should have done it at home. I'm just kidding. It's not in your control. <laughs> Okay. Online, uh, how do you uh, right click on the desk and say simple volume. Simple what happened? What happened? <coughs> oh, okay. Uh, here, here, here. Zahid, Zahid. Here. So go here. Okay, look at this. Look at this. Right here. Right click. Yes. Guys, help out each other. Help out each other. Look left and right. Who needs help? Okay. So this is uh, add two disks and then format the two disks and create a folder called mailbox on E drive. So you just change it to E and then F. It is here. Uh, so, no, no. It's by default, it's select C. Okay. Oh, yes, yes. So just create them. Okay, you did it. Excellent. Uh, no, you will just create these. Done? <laughs> That's it. And then create folder. Guys, folder. What's happening? What's happening? Don't worry about it. Go ahead. <laughs> Whatever you did. <laughs> okay. 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 You can look at Ali's stream. Ali, can, can you help? Okay. Okay, guys. Yes. Yeah. 
उसमें विंडोज में लॉग इन करेंगे और उसको लॉग इन करते हैं ये तो बस मुझे स्क्रीन पर नहीं पूछा कि आर यू वर्क इन डाटा सेंटर या कोई अदर फील्ड उसका मैं आपको बताता हूं क्या है ओके गाइस हियर एवरीवन एवरीवन जस्ट फ्यू मोर मिनट्स आई विल गो फॉर अ ब्रेक ओके सो हियर आई क्रिएटेड फोल्डर इन ड्राइव 1 एज मेलबॉक्स and on f drive a folder called actually it should be logs so in one mailbox i want to logs so it is logs guys uh now in this we are going to create a mailbox database guys databases are of two types it can be a public folder database or a mailbox database the database we are creating is a mailbox database so what do we need to yes so what do we need to remember mailbox database always have mailboxes it will have mailboxes whereas public folder database will have shared folders so just like in normal windows we create folders and share them in public folder database you create folders and you share them with all of the all of the users for example there can be one public folder for marketing department one public folder for hr it is department wise or it could be administration wise as well <coughs> guys the the concept of public folder was very popular or famous in previous versions exchange 2007 2003 they all have public folders from exchange 2010 and onwards they are now promoting sharepoint instead of public folders so they are not creating public folders so this is why this is why guys we don't have any public folders in exchange by default so here uh so databases are of two types there is mailbox database and public folder database this is just for it contains mailboxes um <clears throat> this one has contains shared folders shared folders so public folders are basically shared folders among all exchange users public folders are not used after exchange 2010 public folders are here if in your environment you have exchange 2007 or previous exchange you can make use of this database if not there is no need to add it yes they are using public folder because they are coming from previous version so what's the uh, they are coming from previous version they cannot just let go public folder unless everything is upgraded to sharepoint what's sharepoint so sharepoint is a completely different product it's a web based documentation system it's a complete documentation system um so so they are encouraging public first for that now database that we are creating is a mailbox database for now so once you create a mailbox database guys uh here it asks you the name of the database it's very important to name it accordingly uh um, uh logically. logically so executive so, and database so just right click new database yes new mailbox database and then you can select a server as well if you need to create it on a different server you can select otherwise it's going to it's going to create it on the same server where you are running this command and next we have to select it okay okay so we can select it next 
And here the database. Now it is very important, guys. It is very important to follow this path. Now do not change it, although you can. So guys, look at this. Now here there are two ways to name two name two ways to. To, to set up the location. Number one, you can put E and F, simplest. But then, uh, in real environments, this is what we do. We just take out this complete from here till mailbox and leave the name executive so that we know that executive, that's a mailbox, that's a folder for example. So I'm going to take out, because mailbox, I already have it on that desk. So I'm not going to remove mailbox. So uh, actually, I'm going to remove mailbox. So this is, this will be completely replaced by e and slash mailbox. So now on my server, let's confirm. So e has mailbox and f has log files. So all I'm going to do, just say e colon slash mailbox and executive rest of the names are are same and for the log files I'm going to say F and it says mailbox and I'm going to put it in logs so I'm going to put it in log why did we put executive at the end we only uh, put the econ logs hmm? In the path, we should put e column logs, right? No, no. The reason right. is because the same disk will have other mail other oh, so other other, this, data, other databases as well. Okay, so it will create this folder or it, it, exactly. Okay. It will create a folder. Name executive. It will create a folder, and in that folder, it has only executive files. files. Okay. Otherwise, then you're gonna have mix of all yeah, yeah, transaction yeah. log files. So once this is done, you click OK, next. It will create the database and will mount the database. Once the database is created, just before the break, the only one thing we need to do, we need to create a new user, and we're going to keep that mailbox in a new uh, in this database. So it is creating the database. It is created. It shows us the PowerShell statement. It shows us the PowerShell statement here. If you need to know, it is new dash mailboxes, mailbox database, server name, and the name executive, the path locations of both, and that's it. So, so for all of them, it shows you these PowerShell statements. So finish. Once this is done, let's verify in this location what has been created. So in E drive, in mailbox, I can see a folder called executive. And within executive, I see only a EDB database, which is the main database of your Exchange server. And on, and on F drive, I have logs and mailbox and executive and all other files are here. So E has only the EDB file, which we just said. E has the EDB file and all your log file, checkpoint file, reserve file, transaction log files, all exist in that other drive. Um, <clears throat> now, now this is to show us, this is to show us that these are the files that are required to if you need to rebuild database from transaction log files. If at any point in time EDP goes down, you can rebuild that complete file from these files. Okay. Uh, this is done. This is done by uh, commands. This is done by commands. Where is it? On E drive. I think this is this is system owned this is system owned data. We don't change it. Is this not a file or log file or not? No, no, this is not log file. This is I think this is indexing file for, for the database. We don't need to know about this is just a system owned folder. Um okay, so so let's do this one last thing. Uh Guys, let's go to mailbox under recipients. So under recipient, just create a new user. So new mailbox. So we are creating just new mailbox in that database. 
and we need to log in with that user. Once you log in successfully, then it means that it's working, it's fine, it's mounted, and then we'll go for a break. So new new mailbox. So now I'm creating a new mailbox. It's a user mailbox, and next. It's a new user. It doesn't exist in Active Directory, so we are going to create this user. Next. In this case, we are creating this user. Yes. Say it either you can create your own name users. Your executive. Guys, I can't hear. Okay, database file path of C mailbox, what you did, and then log folder path of C drive. Is that okay? No, so, F, F drive. F. Guys, in this case, the only thing you need to be careful of when you create, when it asks you to create a mailbox, it should be created in this database. Yes. Otherwise, it will automatically create into other one. I think so. Uh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's see, let's see. Oh yes, so the first one is the default one. First one is the default. One. How do we know first one is default? Here. Yeah. No, it's because you selected it. When I did it, it wasn't showing it. I had to choose it. No, no. Yes, you're right. It's not. It won't. But if you don't select, it will create it in your first database. So here, yes, I selected it. Otherwise, it won't show you this. Uh, what's your question, Zahid? Uh, on a retention policy, if, if you go click on retention policy, browse. So retention, this is a default retention policy. Retention policy is, again, existed on the same place where we saw earlier. Understand. Yes. Do you have to configure for each user or not? No, no, it's not. You don't need to. You don't need to. Only in special. Then the default retention policy will work for all of them. Yes. So you will only configure it if it is a special group and there is a special policy for them. So this is active sync means it's an archive mailbox policy. So after the break, I'll go through this. Uh, for now, just create a default user. 
and just quickly log into OWA and see that if you're if you're able to log in. Don't create a, an archive. Nothing. Don't do not create an archive. Uh, it is inside the user's properties. So should we log so in? So right click, yes. Just go to Outlook Web okay. Access, log in with this user and see that and send an email to another existing user. So it's so here is the properties and if you go to so here it says it is inside this database. So right on the on the main it says that it is inside this database. Okay guys. So all we need to do is I'll log in from my other log in from my other machine and the username <coughs> When you log in, guys, make sure you use your domain account. So I'm logged in, which means this user is working fine and user is able to send. When you do a very first test, guys, when you do a very first test, always send one email to yourself and one e and CC to another user so that you can cross check both things. So mail flow, send one email to yourself and I'm going to send CC to another user so that I can check both things that it is doing uh, uh, sending an email to a different database as well. So this is again a test. Sending to myself, sending to another user. This other user sits in another database. So here I received it on my end and in, in M. Ali's case, I received it from so say it's headers from to to Emily. Now this means your database is working, your account is working, it is able to send email, your authentication is working, your DNS is working, everything. So this one uh, mail flow test would give you everything. Yes. So guys, let's go for a break. I'll help out whoever needs it, and later we're going to create more database. <laughs> She's easy. Accessible, you know. Me. No, Khalid. No, Khalid. I just said, stop. Because I'm not easy to stop. So guys, just before the break we were discussing, just before the break, a quick review of what we have discussed today. Today, we were discussing a very, very important topic inside Exchange, which is managing databases or working with database. So today, we started with uh, understanding our Exchange environment. This is our Exchange. We have one client, two Exchange, actually three Exchange servers. Um, now, first Exchange server is installed with typical installation. Typical installation includes only three roles. So you have mailbox, cache, and hub. Um, and then we understood that there is one default database in each Exchange server. And that one that default database has mailboxes inside. Each mailbox has inbox, outbox, or inbox uh, draft, and all of the other uh, all of the other folders. Now here we started with EMC. EMC is divided into three major parts, which is organization, server, recipient. We learn that anything you do, that you do under organization setting that would affect your complete uh, organization. And this includes your address list, this includes your retention policy, this includes your databases, overall database limits, and all that. And under servers, under servers, you have specific mailbox database settings. So if you if you go on to EMC, if you go on to EMC, this is my organization level. 
Under this, I have mailbox and I have these uh, uh, settings inside, whereas you go into mailbox and here you see that this is how you, you, learn, you read the environment. So let's say you're a new exchange admin going into any organization and you need to know how many servers are there and what roles are on each server. And you can see that all in here. So this is your server name and right on this side, it says that on this exchange server, you have hub, CAS and mailbox. If you have other servers, they would have, if they have only mailbox server roles, so that's only mailbox server role, it doesn't have any other roles. And then we created a new database and then we placed it in, um, uh, in, in a separate drive based on exchange best practices. You need to, first of all, do not keep the exchange database on a system drive. Best practice number one. Best practice number two, do not keep transaction log files and database on the same drive. So we keep them on separate drive. Um, so we kept it on a separate drive here. And then under recipient and mailbox. So we saw the mailbox under organization. We saw mailbox under server. And now we're looking at mailbox under recipient configuration. Now, once you see the mailbox, this, this is all about how many types of mailboxes are there and how do we use them. So in here, if you right click on this and you say new mailbox, first of all, on this side, when it is selected, this is a result, result pane where you see all your mailboxes. And on this side, it's, it, it tells you that what type of mailbox is this. So this one is a user mailbox. This one is um, uh, again a user mailbox. And then here it says the primary email address or SMTP address is this. Guys, for outside, for normal users who are not exchange, email addresses are just email addresses. So they would ask you, what is your email address? Your email address is administrator at canups.pri. But guys, for us, these are SMTP addresses. SMTP address for exchange is, again, same as email address. So we call them SMTP address. When you're talking to other exchange admins, they would say, okay, did you check your SMTP address? Or where is your SMTP uh, uh, connected to? So your SM so this is why it says primary SMTP address. Basically, it's your email address. So first, first is this. So here, it, it shows you what is the uh, email type. Now, with each email address, with each email address, on this side, you see a lot of properties here. For example, the very first thing, uh, on if you select any email address on this side and then on this side the very first uh, option is enable archive now enable archive enable archive on this it's a new feature yes uh, SMTP simple mail transport pro uh, protocol Simple mail transport. So SMTP refer to um, uh, SMTP is referred to is referred to sending email outside. Do, okay. So later on, I'm gonna go into more detail. Once we start with CAS, this is in CAS. We're gonna go through these protocols. Okay. For now, just remember, if somebody is referring to SMTP, somebody is referring to SMTP, that is your, your email address. So here. Um, Email, uh, sorry, mailbox. And the very first thing we are discussing enable archive. <coughs> and then you have delete, you have under enable archive, you have disable, then you have remove. And then you can enable unified messaging. So, so by default, guys, archiving is not enabled on any mailbox. Now, first of all, we need to remember that this refers to a mailbox. This refers to a mailbox. Now, by default, archiving is not enabled. Guys, previously, in previous versions, other than 20, 2010, so this is 2010, and in 2007, 2003, 2000, there was no archiving built into Exchange. No archiving was in Exchange. So here you can say no local mail 
both are timing. In these versions, we used to use third-party products. Third-party products like uh, Commvault, like Commvault, and there are a few others. Uh, archiving, archiving, archiving. So, uh, so, so Commvault is. Huh? Enterprise Vault. Enterprise Vault as well. There are many actually. Enterprise Vault. What is? Now what is? Archiving. What is archiving? Guys, right, archiving is. Archiving is basically when you archive anything, what it does, it creates a copy of this email, your mailbox, on a separate location where it would keep your older emails. So, in archiving, once you enable this, what it does, it creates a copy. This is your original e mailbox. And this is a copy of your mailbox. Now, this copy of the mailbox will, will have your older email. So, archive refers to some older information. So, it is, it, it's a copy of your mailbox that, that has uh, older emails. Now, these older, your question might be how old are emails? This depends on what is your archiving policy. Your archiving policy is that any email older than 90 days should be sent to, to this archiving ma mailbox. Or any email that is older than 60 days should be sent outside. Uh, so, so, this, so this depends on policy, archiving policy, archiving policy, and uh, this policy can be um, Mails. Yes. So, so we can create a separate database. First of all, uh, or you can keep it elsewhere. You can keep it elsewhere, but by default, it will keep it in the same database. By default, it will keep it in the same. Database. So here, as soon as I say enable archive, now it is saying, okay, you're creating a local archive or you're creating it in a hosted remote drive. So you can create it in, a, in another drive. You can, you can create an archive here. Um, so select a specific mailbox database rather than having selected automatically. So if you don't have a separate database, let's say I create a separate database for executive just for archives. I must create the database and then I can, I can send, create that archive in that other database. If you don't, then it will create that archive mailbox in the same database. Guys, the idea behind this is, the idea behind archiving is to keep your mailbox, to keep your mailbox lighter. So if all users' mailbox is lighter, your overall database will be lighter. And if your overall database is lighter, your, your database will be quicker, faster in performance. It can read quickly, read, write quickly. So the idea about archiving is to move all your old information outside. Now, the most important thing here is that in all previous version, archiving solution was not added to Microsoft. Microsoft, we used to go with third-party products like Com Vault, <coughs> like Enterprise Vault, like there are some other, uh, some other archiving. But as being in exchange interviews, they will ask you a question for this that have you worked on any archiving solution in exchange? Guys, all of these archiving solution works exactly in the same manner. What they do is, there is an archiving server. So uh, there is, so this is your exchange server, the re main exchange server. It, ha it is a mailbox server, and in mailbox server, you have a database, it has mailbox. And this is your main server. And for archiving from Commvault, Enterprise Vault, or any other archiving solution. All they have is another server that is dedicated for archiving. And then they, what they do is we create a policy inside. So this is a policy. And then attach this policy to the mailbox server. And this policy just dictates this, that how old information, how much information does it need to take out from this mailbox as soon as, let's say, emails. So one policy could be, emails greater than 90 days. 
So email greater than 90 days, as soon as it reaches, it would take out those emails and would create a special mailbox, copy of this mailbox and move those mails uh, here. Or there can be, so there, there, there are many different rules that can be, so one rule is this. Second rule is all emails with heavy attachments, all emails with heavy attachments. So uh, equal to attachment, let's say attachment more than 10 MB. So 10 MB attachment emails are also moved to archiving. So now, so all these archiving solution works exactly in the same manner. They have an archiving server. They do have a policy. Policies are attached to mailboxes. And then once the policy is attached, it would start archiving. Now, your question is, once your email is moved to archive, how is it accessed back? How do you access it back? Because it's not in your mailbox. It is here. So guys, what happens is that in each mailbox, in each mailbox, where that email, for example, you're in inbox, and in inbox you have all these emails, email. So if this email is greater than 90 days, it will be moved into this. But in here you have a link to the archived email. Archive email. So what happened? As soon as the user presses the link. This request goes to the archive server. Archive server retrieves that email and give it back to you. So for most of the time, the email, you don't have that email. Your, your, in, your <laughs> inbox is very small. But as soon as they click on that email, the request goes to archiving and give it back to you. This is what archiving so email is comes tab back to hmm? it's, a tab. It's, a, it's a tab in Outlook. Is the email delivered back to the inbox? Is it transferred back to the inbox or no? It is. It is, and then when the policy runs again next day, it will for it's older than archive. 90 days, yeah. it will be again sent back. Again sent back. So all the arch archiving solution. Now, now many different clients have different type of uh, archiving. I'll come back to your question. And you might have a toolbar here. You might have a toolbar here for special archiving in Outlook. And you just click that button, and then it will bring the email that you need, and you can read it. And, and and this is how it works. Question? If we clean up from the archive as well. So when you go back, like if you don't leave that email, you know, leave it there, and you go back up to that email, still there is archive. So it will retrieve from the archive folder. As long as you don't delete the link, yeah. as long as you don't delete the link, it, will, it can get it from there. But if it is deleted, then re deletion retention policy will work on that. So as long as you have them, you never deleted them, they are moved into archive, they are kept safe here. So archive has its own policy for so uh, that is deletion? The yes, it has its own, its own policy. policy. It's a complete database. It's it's another mailbox database, but this is just for archiving. So it's just, no it's, um, no, there is exchange. There is exchange. It's a complete simple database. But 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 hold on. So I'm giving you two solutions. This is a solution from a third party. So third party would bring their own server, like Commvault, Enterprise Vault. They install their own database. It could be a SQL database. It could be any other database. And they keep all your emails in their database. And from here they back them up as well. They back them up as well. So they do everything. But in Exchange 2010, they they gave you this archiving solution. So Exchange 2010, all you need to do is to go to that mailbox and enable archive. Now, as soon as you enable archive, it is asking you, where do you want to keep this mailbox database? Do you have a separate database? If not, then what it does, it would just create an archive on the same in within the same database. So as you can see, it is just enabled now. So, and then it is all being managed in the background. Yes. So if uh, when it goes to archive, is it still the same size for that email? Same. same. Uh, no. So on in your inbox, you would see just a link, maybe one KB link. Right. If the real email is 10, 10 MB, you don't see that. It is now moved into so the archive. In this solution, Commvault or Enter, Enterprise Vault, do they provide online uh, archive? Or they provide all, everything. Online. Everything. It is online as well. It is local as well. It is cloud-based as well, oh, wow. so it's everything. So guys, here Exchange 2010 provides you archiving. If you need to create an archive 
uh, it has to be done on a design level. It's not that it, it's not that you just go randomly and just choose. If in your environment they have archiving, then and they are asking you to make changes, guys. We are not exchange expert. We won't make any changes. You do understand what archiving is. So they would ask you, okay, so uh, what is archiving? Archiving is just, it's a policy that runs. It would take out older emails. So I can give you a real policy. So this is one of the real policies in, in one of the organization. So you can refer to this, that they had an archiving policy of more than 90 days, it is moved into archiving mailbox. And then in user, they have a link. As soon as they click the link, the mail, but the important thing here is you must be logged in to the network. If you're not logged in, this archive cannot be accessed. That's logical. So the problem with archiving is as long as you're online, you can see them. If you now Outlook Web Access cannot even work if you're not online, right? But if you are in Outlook, Outlook will work. Outlook works offline, but Outlook will work archiving won't work for archiving in outlook you must be connected to the exchange server so that's the only difference you need to remember yes 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 we have 100 users for each time we have to label this no just like this you can select all and then you can just enable archiving so select all of them and but this is what i this is what i'm saying we can do this all, but you should follow your own company's design, how they how they have designed our target. So what's the uh, user access to the archive below? And then we go back into archive or just back into Yes, as soon as the next time policy runs, it would see that it was that's an 90 days old, it would be sent back again. Okay. <clears throat> so guys here, now on the on the same uh, mailbox here you also have the ability to enable unified messaging if you have a unified messaging configured in your environment and about unified messaging we we, we uh, discussed last time unified messaging doesn't exist anymore with exchange it is now moved to a link server which is totally a, a different uh, application so and and even guys even when it was here from the days of Exchange 2007 and Exchange 2010, this was never used. Why? Because people, companies, they rely on more stable solutions from, from, uh, from Cisco. They don't rely on uh, unified messaging, although there were many projects, many failed as well. Uh, now, from here, you can, you can, what you can do, you can uh, uh, move mailboxes as well. Now, here, for example, you need, if you right click on this, it says new local move request or new remote move request. Let's see what is the difference. First of all, both are move requests. You are moving this mailbox from somewhere. So you're moving mailbox from. Now local means within the same server. So here, uh, within the same server from one database to another database. Remote means from this database to another server's database or maybe online, maybe to the cloud. It's just a complete mailbox movement from one exchange server to another. Now, what is the most important thing that we need to remember about moving? Guys, the most important thing is, the most important thing about movement of mailboxes is this. Um, let's say, this is, this is Outlook. This is Outlook. When the Outlook starts for the first time, what is Outlook though? What is Outlook? It's a, it's a client application for Exchange. It's a client application. So, so, so in order for user, user first log into AD on his machine. After that, the user opens Outlook and Outlook now needs to connect to Exchange server. So this is your Exchange server and here is your CAS. So Outlook basically connects to CAS and from here it connects to Exchange server. About mailbox movement, we must remember these few things. N number one, that it is always the CAS who knows where is the user's mailbox. If it is on server one and basically which database it is on. So CAS needs to know where it is moved. So now when you do a remote move and you moved a mailbox from here, it was here and you moved it to this one. 
Guys, in this case, most of the time, Outlook cache will automatically uh, redirect your Outlook to this. But sometimes you need to completely shut down Outlook and re-log into Outlook. So, uh, and why this is important to know, in Exchange 2010, this has been greatly improved. What is greatly improved? The movement and automatic effect of movement. In previous versions, in previous version, CAS was not that intelligent enough to know that, oh, you move the mailbox unless you go in and, and, and configure a few things in CAS. But now, as soon as you do this movement request, and you can move it from, move one mailbox from your, uh, from the default database to the executive database. Once you move it, it is moved, and as soon as the user connects, Outlook, Outlook connects to CAS. From CAS, now CAS knows, oh, it's, lo the location is changed, it would now connect to this. And guys, this is the reason. This is one of the reasons. How much of the reason? One, one of the reasons, one. guys. One of the reasons. This is one of the reasons why in Exchange 2007, Outlook were directly connected to Exchange. This is what we discussed last time, right? In previous Exchange here, Outlook was the only client that used to directly connect. And it was that reason that created a lot of errors, a lot of problems. Um, so, so for that reason, and this is one of the reasons, then there were other reasons too. Now all clients connect to this, and CAS is responsible. Wherever the mailbox is, CAS knows, and it would connect you to the, uh, to the mailbox. So if mailbox is moved, now my question to you is, what are the reasons for moving mailbox? What could be the reasons for moving mailbox? Capacity. Maybe disk space. Maybe disk space. Or or maybe maybe use user moved to another location. Maybe user became an executive now, so you need to move it into another location. User moved from one department to another department, and it has a separate database. So there can be many different reasons. Now let's do one move request. Or user got fired. No, it. I'm, you never delete anything. You disable it. You do keep an archive of it. Yes. So, what is that? Uh, SpongeBob? What? Huh? Okay. Okay. Yes. What is it? New local move request. New local move request? Like, what's the difference? So difference difference is uh, if I remember correctly, this is in the same server to another mailbox database, and the other one is to another server. So let's do it. Let's do it. So here, let's do a local. Yes. So local move. I'm doing a local move now, and I selected a user. It is sitting in this database, and I need to select a target database. So here. I can see only databases in this same server. I'm not able to see databases on other servers, right? So in this case, I'm going to move. So one more time, one more time. This is what I'm doing. You can see other databases. Okay. So so let's do this. So let's let's do the remote move. I think that is for cloud maybe. So let's do this first. Uh, move. Selected into separate database. I'm going to select executive. He was executive. <laughs> so executive is an executive. So I think, oh, remote forest. It's for other organization. It's for other organization. Okay. Huh? To the other organization. Locally is within the organization from any database to any database. It could be other uh, It could be other exchange server as long as they're in the same. So here, remote move. Okay. Yes. So remote move is saying another organization if it is part of your. It could be cloud. It could be another organization. Then once you move the database. So we did a local one. Once you to executive. Once you move the user to another database, it cannot be the user cannot be used, uh, moved again. It doesn't show the option actually. Once the user is moved, then you click on that user. It doesn't show. I think it is still being moved. Once. Being moved. Yes. Uh, once it is moved. 
Is no longer shows the same options. Yes. Because um, this operation can be performed because object whatever couldn't be found on Tanis exchange one dot Tanis dot PRI. Which one? This one. New local move request, right? I did um, everything. Go back, go back. I did this. Yes. Okay. It's in their marketing, by the way. Fine. Yes. So operation could not be performed because the objective could not be found in exchange. It's in their marketing. So just wait for refresh. It doesn't recognize the object. It's not in your. It's it's not in your other database. Well, what should I do? Just, just, yeah, just wait. Or maybe create a new user. Okay. And under users or under um, like marketing, HR, finance? Um, under, under marketing. Okay, guys, there are two, two, two more things here. So, which is, which is very commonly which is very commonly used in exchange and as an exchange admin you should know uh, there are two permissions so permission is manage send as permission or manage full admin permission full access permission now send as permissions send as permission or manage full access permission this is to assign someone who can send emails on your behalf this access is so sometimes when some people are not in office and you want other people to send on their behalf, you can add those people. So this is manage send as permission for this mailbox. Now, in this case, uh, let's say let's say I have, uh, and mostly this is done for departmental folders. So maybe help desk at company uh, canf.pri, uh, your support center as canf.pri, so if people need to send emails on their behalf, you can just send uh, set them as send as permission. But with send as permissions, they do not have full access. Guys, send as permission, they can only send on their behalf. So if I go on uh, Nasser's email and set it as send as, and then send as, I will go add with your permissions RF. So RF has been given access on Nasser's mailbox. So in the mailbox. So you permission in the mailbox. So So guys, this is one thing. Send as permissions is only send as permissions. In send as permissions, you can he cannot access his mailbox but then this is where the second access comes from second access is full access so if you need to give them full access all you need to do go on to that person and assign full access so this was ever grant remove uh, grant or remove full access permission to the selected mailbox for the user where you can grant permission here let's add uh let's say another account oh, Adnan. Let's add another account, and this says this is full access. Now, how do you access them, and how do you do this access? What question? How do you understand the first thing? Send, send us permission. Ask yes, send us permission is just this. So, user number one has a mailbox, and now you have user number two who needs to access. So, this user is going on vacation. So, in this case. There are some emails that need to be sent from this mailbox. So you can give this user send as permissions. Send as. Send as access. He will be able to access my inbox? No, he cannot access your inbox. Okay. He can send on his behalf. So, so okay. when this user opens a new email, so guys, let's see how does a send as looks like. Send as would look like this. You have to have Outlook for this. Guys, you have to have Outlook for this, everyone. Send as you have to have Outlook, and for Outlook, um, there is a special for, there is a special menu in file that says uh, you need to add the from field. 
normally in Outlook, it doesn't show you the from field. Normally it shows you two CC and BCC. So first of all, you need to enable from, and then in from, you would say, for example, username is A, so then you can say A at the rate tanf.trs. So you can write his email address. Once that email address is written and he has sent as access, then he can oh. send email on his behalf. And the other user will receive that email showing his name and writing that this email is sent by Nasser on behalf of RF. Both then will be able to enable the from. Hmm? From. In that case, you have to uh, configure his email box in your Outlook first. No. In that case? No, 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 no. no not, I, not in this case. In full access case. No, in full access case. Where does case. that from come from? Can you, how do you enable uh, that? You Can you have know? to add, uh, add their account into your Outlook, right? You cannot. Not in, out, not, not in OWA, but in Outlook. In so Outlook, you can. You can. Yes. No, no, but, but you said that. Yes, in this case, there is no delegation access. Oh, but you said that there, has to, there is another field from. So we need to add that to field. Add that field. Who's yes. going to add that field? So, so I'm this? opening Outlook okay. and I'm going to show you I mean, where is it added. Is it just the administrator can add the field or? No, no, anyone can anyone add. Can. Anyone. If you need to add the from field in your Outlook, mm -hmm. you can just go and add that field. And if you have their email access send us, then you can send emails on their behalf. Yes. Like you said, uh, when the person... So that can happen if you, if you select new, new email and then... Yes, only email. new, yes. What? So, how would I know without sending the email that this person has the right to work on... You won't know. You won't know. You will be told by your manager that since he's on vacation, now you have the access on his behalf. The only way to test this out, you need to test it by sending email on his behalf. Yes, you're right. You won't know. You won't know automatically because there is nothing in email that says that you have access on his behalf. Only exchange admin can go and check that out. <coughs> so, exchange, so want to check it out. If I go and Yes, for that you need to go to the same location, uh, send as access, and you would find this user. So, guys, the question here is that how do you know if somebody has somebody's mailbox access as send as? So, all you need to do is go here, right click on this user, go to send as access, and here within this it shows that who has send as access to the user. So, you need to have Exchange Admin. Uh, Access for that. There's not showing anti authority. Is it? Anti authority is the exchange system itself. Anti authority okay. is the exchange system itself. Which has all the permissions. Yes, which has all the permissions to do the maintenance and all that in your mailbox. Um, but, guys, in some cases, so this was just sent as access. But in some cases, this person needs to have full access to his mailbox. So that is where the second uh, option is. So this person can have full access. Now, once they have full access, they can go into their Outlook and add. So this person has its own inbox and draft, send. And right under this, he can have this other user as well. So RF account. So this is Nasser's own mailbox. And then he can add RF account. And since he has full access, he can add full access to this mailbox. So second mm -hmm. access is this. Full access. So is that used for like, let's say, our friends on vacation? Yes, mostly, mostly. Or if RFI was respectfully let go, <laughs> and then Nasser Bhai can take over. Yeah. Nobody. Or RFI was let. I can't do it. That's why I have to take over. You won't leave. <laughs> so okay. I'll kick you out then. You won't leave respectfully. Yeah? <laughs> okay, so guys, now let's let let's create a new mailbox. So when you create a mailbox, what? Yes, new recipient, new mailbox. So in under recipient, Saf, what's your question? Uh, actually, I am. Um, my outlook is not working. There is another form. Which is the form field. 
that is the if same you get thing. An email that, from the, that is the same thing. No, I mean when you get an email from someone. It's a wrong combination. Why are you guys sitting together? Adnan is so cool and calm. What, what what's happening? Nothing. No, he, he just said that this thing's working finally. Okay. Here. So guys, this is my outlook. So guys here from so in Outlook, you can have other from here. So here I can say other email address. So as soon as you have in Outlook, I can send email from another person, email address. For that, you need to go to from up there. So by default, it shows you your default email address. And then if you need, if you have access for other mailboxes, you can just go here and say, I am sending this from rf at canf.pri. And once you do this, now the from field is changed. But yes, you can, any user can do this, but as long as they have access, send as access for that particular user. Now, now this is, this is a very common task that might be uh, asked to you uh, to go and get somebody send as access. So you need to know it is in EMC. You can select the user, right click, send as access. Now, if this user has full access, what can you do in that case? Guys, this is just a uh, from access. In send as access, user cannot see, Arif cannot see his email. If Arif needs to see all his emails, then in that case, you need to give full access. So full access is actually from the same place. So you will go here, right click on that mailbox and say full access. Once they have full access, once they have full access, you need to go back to Outlook. Within Outlook, you can go to here, account settings. Within account settings, you can go and add another account under this. So you can say, I need to add another account, new account. So once that new account is added, once that new account, so this is this is one account, and the second account is marketing. So even in my uh, Outlook, I have two, two accounts here. So this is one account, this is second account. So you can see many accounts in one Outlook, provided they have access to that other mail, mailbox. What is, oh, is it? I'm sorry about that. I am sorry about that. So here. So this is one account, and this is the second account. This is second. So likewise, you can add many accounts. And guys, in many organization where you go to, um, they, you would see many secondary accounts connected to one user. So you might need to fix them. Some people would ask you that I had this access, access yesterday, but today this account is not opening. So basically, when some account is not able to open, all you need to do, so what do you need to do? This is a very common issue that as a second level exchange admin or first to second level exchange admin, you have to fix. And that is, and that is that this person is saying that I had access to marketing and yesterday, today I'm not able to. Once you go here, for now it is showing me, but sometime it shows no permission. Guys, in this case, all you need to do is go into EMC, go into marketing mailbox, right click permission and see that if this other person has full access to the mailbox. That's the only thing you need to do. So in there, uh, so this is, this is two types of access that you can do. So from is not available in Outlook Web Access. So OWA, you must have a full-fledged client so that then you can send emails. It has it. Yeah, it's it's it has it. It, it has it? Yeah, options, it is in the options. Okay. Show from. Okay, so it is. Okay, so it is show from. It is there. Okay, yeah, that's fine. Options in there. Okay, so the second thing. Let's create a new mailbox, guys. Mailboxes are are of are of basically. So first of all, user mailbox is only one. So user mailbox is this. Then you can have room mailbox. You can have equipment mailbox. You can have linked mailboxes. Now, first of all, room mailbox. Room mailbox is mostly for meeting rooms or board rooms. 
So why do you have to have a mailbox? These mailboxes didn't exist in 2007-2003, first time introduced in 2010. And the main purpose of this mailbox is so that people can schedule those meeting rooms automatically. So for example, if I need to schedule meeting room number two, which is outside, I, I have, I'll create a room mailbox and I'll just send one email saying that I booked it from 9 to 8. So you can just book it and then you can, that email will be sent to all attendees as well. And same goes for equipment. Equipment mostly refers to projectors. So people need to schedule projectors for meetings, uh, uh, scanners, printers, so whatever, any, any equipment. Um, now link mailboxes, link mailboxes, um, it is used to trusted forest. Okay, so this link mailbox. Link, ma link mailboxes, so one user has one mailbox in on-premises and second mailbox on cloud. On cloud, same user, two mailboxes. So one mailbox exists on-premises and second mailbox exists in cloud. Mostly this is, uh, this is in the case of if you have Office 365 uh, subscription and you have other mailboxes that are so linked to same same user. Uh, first of all, let's let's create a user account here. Now, as soon as you create a user account, we already created a user account, and then we created let's create a new user account. And then in this user account, guys, this time I'm not creating. I'm 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 showing you how to create a mail enabled user. So there is just a recipient. Secondly, there was mail enabled user. Mail enabled user is the user who has email uh, who has external email is not using your company's email, the user who is using external email. So here, <coughs> we have so mailboxes. So these are all of the mailboxes. So first of all, user mailbox. User mailbox is just a recipient, normal mailbox, that the user has an account in your, in your Active Directory and mailbox from your company as well. Second one is mailbox, mail user or mail enabled Active Directory user. This is, you have a user in Active Directory, but you're not providing them email address. They will be, you will provide them, they will bring their own email address from Gmail or Yahoo or all those uh, other address. Resource, Mailboxes are equipment or room mailboxes. These are those mailboxes. Whereas mail contents, mail contacts are, they do not have account. They do not have mail email from our company. They are just a contact in our address book. So basically, we have three types of mailboxes here. One is, uh, one is recipient, which is in which we have an AD account and mailbox from our company. So this is very common. This is your own company, own user. Second one is mail user. Mail user, you have AD account, but no mailbox. They're using their external email. So basically, with you, you will provide them AD account, and then you're going to link their Gmail or Hotmail with your AD account. So in this case, you are providing them AD account, but not a mailbox. Whereas there is third one, which is mail contact. Guys, mail contact is no AD account and no mailbox. You're not providing them anything, but you can register their external email address in your, in your environment. So basically, they bring their Gmail and Hotmail and you can register it inside the address book, address list. That's it. So here you're providing them both. These are regular employee, employees. This is long-term contractors. So these are uh, they are mostly mostly they are a contractor maybe for six to ten months, and you are providing them this. Uh, maybe your company is also providing the mailbox as well. Maybe they will. And sometimes they won't. They would say, no, we're not providing you mailbox. Uh, you can bring your, and the third one is temporary contractors. For two days or three days, you can add them 
at their external, you're not providing them AD account, you're not providing them main address. So these are the main three types of accounts here. Other than this, there are security groups. There are dis distribution groups we already know. Distribution groups are groups who you can send email. Guys, in Exchange 2010 and in Active Directory 2008 R2, not in 2008, 2008 R2, now you can send email even to security groups. Before you were not able to send emails to security. In Active Directory, there are two types of groups. Security group and distribution, distribution group. Distribution group, we already know the distribution group, you can't send emails. Distribution group. What is another thing that is available in a security group and not available in distribution group? Permissions. Permissions, very good. And what is related to permissions? What? Sid. Sid. No, no, no. I, 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 I never listen to this. Uh, uh, it, it, uh, the answer came from this side? Yeah. <laughs> this guy surprised me. Um, so, and you just let him go from the company. Sorry. We let him go. He's, he's uh, too intelligent. Okay, guys, the question here is uh, distribution groups. Distribution groups do not have SIDs. Distribution groups do not have SIDs. Otherwise, all the objects in our they have SIDs. And if they have SID, if they have SID, you can assign permissions. So the answer was right. Distribution group has, does not have SID. You cannot assign permission. But they have with GUID. They have GUID. Yes, but but with GUID you cannot assign permission. So so but guys, this is where it is. Um, we can we can create an email address for a security group. Now why this is important to know? And I'm gonna finish in just uh, uh, one or ten minutes. Okay, ten minutes. <laughs> ten minutes. Okay, ten more minutes. Five minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Instead of six, ten minutes. Take fifteen minutes. Okay. Fifteen minutes. Okay. The important thing here is you're an exchange admin, and then your manager comes to you and asks you that we have a group inside Active Directory for marketing, or we have a group for finance. Can we send email to that person? Guys, if it would have been Exchange 2003 and Exchange 2007, no. You cannot mail enabled, email enabled a security group. The only group that you can send to is distribution group. But now in 2010 and above, you can mail enable a security group as well. As long as you have a security group, you can just attach an email address and they can start emailing. But guys, we must know it's not recommended. At the same time, when they ask you to... Uh, so this is your group. This is your security group. And this, all they are saying, that go and create a mailbox for this security group. That, that's what they're asking. And in Exchange 2010, you can do this. But guys, based on Microsoft, it's not recommended. The reason is, it's not recommended, because this is a security group. And in security group, not necessarily you have all similar users. Whoever need access to this folder, if this is a folder, you just keep on adding adding people. Some people from marketing, some people from HR, some people from everywhere else. But guys, distribution group mostly is specific people only. So security group is not 100% that these are all similar people and they might need email as well. So Microsoft says, whenever you need to send, create groups, create distribution group for specific people. Although there is uh, you, now you have the facility, don't create distribution groups, just mail enable security group. How do you mail enable a security group? Very easy. Guys, let's mail in a, let's create a group in exchange. Let's go to Active Directory first of all. Let's go to Active Directory. Uh, okay, cancel this for now. And just create, just in, in users, or in marketing, let's go into marketing, create a new security group. So in users, uh, sorry, in OU marketing, create a group. And that group is a security group called marketing GP or SGP. SGP is a security group. So it is a security group. It's a security group, it's a global group. 
security group and a global group. So all you need to do is to create this group. Marketing SGP means security group. If, if it would have been distribution, I would have said DGP. So this is a security group. And then once the group is created, this group is a security group. Now, in order to mail enable this group, you can't do it from Active Directory, from ADUC. In order to mail enable this group, you need to go to EMC. And within EMC, we'll go here. And then in this, in this, first of all, we create, I think it is either distribution group. No. Let's create a new mailbox user user account new user mailbox and in this we'll say existing and here why is it not showing me active directory it doesn't show i tried you have to hit Hold on. So let's quickly find it. Uh, exchange 2010 uh, mail enable security group. Here it is. So mail enable security group. So mail enable security group. And all you need to do is. Hello. In this presentation, I am so to mail to enable within exchange. Notice I've already launched you from this recipient group. Distribution In the actions group. pane, I'm going to specify new distribution, new distribution group. group. Oh yes, from Except here. I'm yeah. going from to click on existing group, group you just and then browse group. for the existing group. It won't be just a like distribution, it will be just a security Notice group. that all the groups okay, in this very simple. So it's so it's under distribution. You just go to new distribution group instead of creating a new group, just say existing. And within this, um, where we need to change the scope and marketing, excellent, good point. Okay, let's see. Nothing. Huh? Is it? Do you see that? Did you go? It's not, it's not looking at it. Okay. No. So it found it. Oh. Hold on. I think it's a local group. Let's go create a local group in this. Local group? I think. Let's see. So I'm creating another group called MKR, being a domain local group, security group. And let's go back to EMC. Create a new distribution group, existing. It's universal. Okay, so you must be a universal group. Doesn't show global, doesn't show local, uh, creating a universal group. Or we can change it to universal. Uh, from properties, change to universal. And EMC. Yeah, now you can Okay, so just universal groups. Okay, good. Thank you, Kinan. Uh, maybe universal, so this is? Universal security group. Right? Universal security group. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what? Universal have global access. Universal has global. But 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 there is a way you can you can also mail enable global groups as well. I think through PowerShell. Existing. Oh, 
Who was it? Oh no, I am red in the viewer. Okay. So here <laughs> so done. Uh, yeah, guys, just one last thing. Let's do it. Uh, create a mail enable contact. Do you put anything in alias? No. Oh, you need to. You need to just alias as the same. Maybe marketing, whatever it is. Just one last thing. Let's create a contact. Uh, not a contact. Mail enable. So what? Yes, just create a universal group. Universal. No, no group. I think global can be done, but through it's through PowerShell. So, so here, mailboxes are of three types. Mailboxes, normal recipient mailbox, which is, which has AD account and exchange accounts. Mail user is you have AD account but no mailbox. And third one, contact, no active directory account, no mailbox, just their contact. Now we are, so this we already created, we are going to create this. Now it's, 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 it's a bit tricky to create this. There is no option, let's see. So there is no option just to create mail user. It would, you need to create a normal user first. Guys here, so here, in order to create a mail user, in order to create a, either you can create this, uh, you, so in order to create a mail contact, first of all, we create this user. So let's say we create a user. An active directory? Yes. Let's create a user, Saud Khan. It could be some Arab name. Uh, can be Khan. So here, let's create any other user. Guys, in this, in this, all you need to do is this. Once this user is completely created, then we'll go inside and we disable the mailbox. So as soon as you disable the mailbox, this will be user without a mailbox. But this user has to be in your EMC. So you will create a user and you disable the mailbox and then you go into properties, attach it with his Gmail account. So this is how it is done. For mail user, so there is, uh, oh yes, here. No, 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 that is contacts. That is this one. That's the third type where you don't have AD account, you don't have, so that is different, that is contact. Oh, it is there now? Let's see. So here I can use mail user and contact. Okay, so it is here. So the other way is that other other way as well. Let's see if this creates the same user. So new mail user under mail contacts. So we'll we'll do that after this. Uh, here, just go into mail contacts, and then go to new mail users. Within mail users, you can go to new user. Let's say South Khan S Khan. Standard password. And here, yes, now the alias it is S Khan, and then external email address is S Khan at Gmail. Okay, so this option is here. So in this case, it's not creating a mailbox. So in previous versions, so yes, here it is, uh, here in previous version, we used to create a user, then you disable their mailbox and attach just an, any external account. Can you go back? So one more time, all you need to do is go into mail contact yeah. and then right click, create a mail contact, uh, mail user. Yeah. So mail user has Active Directory account and no email account. So all you need to do, new, and just create another account. New or existing. If you have existing, you can attach. Uh, you can attach any external account. Now contact. In contact, let's create a contact now. In contact, it is. It is only asking for the new contact. So it's a new contact. 
and in this it won't create an active directory account so for that reason it's not asking for any passwords anything it's just a contact so let's say this is saud last name khan and here i'm going to say this especially is gmail contact so in this alias is gmail So here it is. So now we, we have mail user as S Khan. Mail user is fine. We have mail user as S Khan. What is the difference? The difference is that this one has Active Directory account and this one has nothing. No Active Directory account, no mailbox, just an external account. So normal user has both. Mail user, only Active Directory, no mailbox but refers to external account, whereas contact has nothing, it's just a contact. Guys, the reason why we are creating both of them is just so that they appear in address list. So that when people need to send email, they don't have to remember their email, they would just search by south and they can see both of them. Let's do this on OWA. Yes, in so in contact, yeah, contact is for external user account. Contact, but in this case, there is no active directory. In this, there is active directory. That's the only difference. Otherwise, both are referring to external accounts. Uh, here, let's go to new in OWA. Just open new and now say two and search for south. So in south, although south does not have a mailbox, now it shows us his both accounts, his Gmail account and his Hotmail account. That's the only reason why would you keep contacts or mail users inside your organization. Otherwise, otherwise you don't even create them. And if they give you their email address, you can just write their email address in email and start sending. So the contact does not create a contact in active directory? Active, uh, directory? No. It does not create a user in active directory? Nothing. But nothing. when I, I try to create South Khan, it's, it shows me an error in saying that active directory operation failed on Kenneth's exchange one. See? It tried to create it even though I selected contact. It tried to create it on the active directory one as well. It says it already exists in the same name. No, it will create its, uh, its DN. Just the DN value. You won't name? find you won't find it in in Active Directory. I will still create the because this is Exchange uh, stores everything in X, in Active Directory. Oh, yes. that for that user. and it cannot create two users with exactly the same. Name. Yeah, two users cannot have the same DN. Yes, they can. Guys, just a quick task exercise. Just a quick last exercise and we're done. The last exercise is uh, just one last exercise. Uh, create, create Mr. Fun's all three accounts. So create his recipient account, create his mail user account, create his contact. I need to see that in the next five minutes. Quickly, please. Mr. Fun, we need recipient, we need mail user, we need contact. And once we go into two, you should be able to see all three accounts. Yes. Recipient, mail user, contact. What happened? What happened? What happened? Why are you not doing it? Oh, man.
Male user is also integrated, so it won't be. Yes, so 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 logically, this is not even possible. This is not even. Yes, that's why one user has one account. Then why would the yeah, same user have either one or the other? Yes. yes. So for this one, it, it will be either one or the other. Yeah, exactly. But then you can have a contact for that. Because you can only have one account. Yeah. You can only have one account. That's why it's not like Sai coming in. Yeah. 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 The contract will work though. Yeah. 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 Yeah.